Well, and thank you very much. And and first of all, huge thanks to to Slava Radošević for uh, thinking of this uh, and for putting us together, doing all the groundwork so that we could be on this uh, computer screen all together. And uh, before I delve into into the the first chapter, uh, let me say a few introductory words about about the history of this project. It was really David Diker, who was unfortunately not with us anymore, who was a professor uh, at uh, the University of Sussex, where we met, uh, where I arrived in in '93 after Vesna Bojcic and uh, and Slavo, who were there as well. And uh, David, whom most of you know, I think, was uh, one of the prime experts on on the economies of, of communist countries to speak very, very simply. And David in uh, early 95 came to me and said, you know, why don't we do a book? And uh, if you want, let's, let's be the co-editors of the book. And so I jumped on it, but it was really David's idea. And I think credit uh, must be given where it is due. Um, and uh, Basically, uh, David said, look, I'll take care of, of uh, kind of the editing and all of this stuff, which he did. And, you know, you, you propose the, the writers and, and the people because you're from there, you know, the people. And obviously, you know, Vesna and, and Flau were at Sussex as well. But uh, in, in a very humble way, uh, you know, the, the, the choice of, of the authors was, was mine. And obviously, I was looking for people who you know, have, have a level head, who uh, do not have a vested interest on one or the other side, and who will be, uh, as, as best one can, dispassionate uh, analysts and, and scholars of uh, what is and, and what was going on uh, at, at the time. And uh, it was really then the, the editorial managing skills of, of David that then got us through, uh, you know, Thanks to all the authors who are here on the screen and those who are not. I'm really sorry that uh, Milos Vasic, whom many of you know, is, um, is a journalist, uh, retired now. And I was in contact with Milos and he simply said, I'm out of public life. I don't do anything anymore. So I said, OK, Milos, enjoy retirement. Um, uh, others, uh, you know, have accepted and I hope that maybe Ferid Muhic and, and Frane Adam uh, uh, join us along the way. So it was really a, you know, maybe it's strangely put, but it was a, a Yugoslav initiative. I mean, uh, the framework was to have all these all these people together. Uh, Slavo mentioned uh, that today, the 25th of June, is the, the day when Croatia and Slovenia declared uh, independence. Um, just uh, a week ago, we had another 30th anniversary. And that was the, uh, the day that uh, the Prime Minister, the last Prime Minister of Yugoslavia, Ante Markovic, signed an agreement with a certain George Soros to create a open society Yugoslavia uh, and uh, bring the foundation uh, to this country. And of course, eight days later, uh, he had to start opening, uh, if I dare say, segmentary foundations uh, in the newly uh, declared independent republics. And so we have uh, open society foundations in, in all the former republics and, and in Kosovo uh, as well. And it was a, a wonder if we did a similar webinar like this with the new president, Mark Malik Brown, with uh, Alex Soros and, and others. And it's actually on, on, um, on, uh, on YouTube. So those of you who are interested can watch it. There are documentaries from the various uh, foundations. It tells kind of a, a parallel story of, of what happened and the breakdown and, and George Soros's engagement in particular in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Um, I think it's important to, to mark these dates. And uh, as Slavo said at the beginning, uh, this is very personal for a lot of us. Uh, some people uh, had to leave the country. Uh, I also came to Sussex because I was under threat from a very particularly uh, fascistic moment in, in Serbia. People were being blacklisted and put on names. So there's a whole uh, personal, dare I say, traumatic dimension to, to all of this. And that's why, and it's David's title, 
Yugoslavia and after fragmentation, despair and rebirth. It's, it's really, yeah, again, credit must be given to David who had a knack for, for titles and things. And uh, I think it captured, the, the subtitle really captured what, what we all talk about in this book. It was really a breakdown that frankly, I must have been as a social scientist, I never expected would happen. Uh, I thought that you know maybe there should there could be separation. Let's remind ourselves that three communist federations broke down: Soviet Union, Czechoslovakia, and Yugoslavia. You know, as as someone said recently, Czechoslovakia did it with a with a champagne kind of a drink. Uh, Soviet Union more or less peacefully. We all know what happened in the Baltics, etc. But then Yugoslavia was really the the odd person out in in this story. And uh, again, a personal recollection at the Dubrovnik Inter-University Center in April of 91, we had a debate where people like Habermas were around the table and was then Flego professor of philosophy at, at the Zagreb University and I were kind of supposed to talk about the situation. And my prediction, completely false of course, was that there would be low intensity violence, but you know, who's crazy enough to go uh, and have a war at the end of the 20th century in the middle of Europe. And Gwazdan was more pessimistic than I was. He said, well, I don't think it'll be that, that easy. And so he was the more realistic uh, than I was. And of course the, re the rest is history. And so I think the, the lesson that sort of I drew from all of this, that the evil of history can return even in places where we endlessly repeated never again, never again a Holocaust, never again war. You know, the European community was, was put together. And uh, so when we had the rise of populism and right-wing movements towards the end of the 2000s in Europe, you know, the, the ugly head of the past uh, reared itself. Many people said, you know, this is not a Weimar moment. Of course, it wasn't a Weimar moment, history doesn't, repeat itself in the same forms, but uh, it was clear that we had to get our kind of antennas out and uh, identify uh, all those ugly things where people wanted to go back to the nativist, identitarian, you know, you name it, right wing, uh, closing onto oneself, uh, sovereignism in the worst possible form and uh, trying to uh, deal with issues uh, which, and you know, this is Susan's big thing, you know, uh, the, the socioeconomic, the rise of inequality in the world, which for me is, was one of the great values of, of Susan's uh, earlier book and then her second book to uh, distinguish and to uh, dig deeper into why the 80s created an atmosphere that made uh, what was possible later. But, but we'll come to that, of course, uh, in, in a moment. So. Uh, as I said, very emotional, very, as Slava said, you know, a great moment mm -hmm. to, to look back. You know, if I can uh, sort of put out a blanket statement um, to, um, to say that I wouldn't change anything in what I wrote, and I don't think many of you would change much in what you wrote. The book stands uh, very firmly, uh, and uh, I think that testifies to all of your qualities as intellectuals and, and uh, social scientists, economists, uh, political scientists. And uh, that, that's why it's fantastic that Slava put us together it's for us to, uh, um, uh, to realize uh, what we did. You know, uh, we, many of us, of course, you know, when we sit down around the coffee table among you know, those of us who went through all of this, we always say, my God, the stuff that we went through, is it possible that we're still here and that we have a head on our shoulders? I mean, when you start enumerating the craziness of, of history that rolled over our heads and shoulders, fortunately, we're still alive, many are not. And that's why, why the despair and we must remember, you know, the victims that, uh, that suffered uh, uh, with their lives, with, uh, with disabilities and, and with displacement. I mean, the picture again on the front of the book was one that uh, David, David found. Um, and uh, uh, again, a personal moment, I, I, I looked at it and I said, you know, do we really want to show this? You know, can't, can't, we, can't we show a, the Adriatic coast or something? 
and and then of course uh, after after having kind of digested it, I say yeah this is absolutely the right the right picture because it is always the civilians that suffer it is always the civilians that suffer and it's people like like this so I'm sure that that many of us have have uh, tales to tell so I won't um, as a person of an older generation, uh, go deeper into all of these memories, and I'll stop here and I'll say just a few things about about the the initial chapter, um, Yugoslavia, 1945, 1991, from decentralization without democracy to dissolution. And uh, I was reading Vladimir Gligorov the other day. Somebody had interviewed him, and he was asked, you know, tell me in one sentence what is the reason for the demise of Yugoslavia, and he said, the absence of democracy. That's exactly the argument I made uh, in, in, this, um, in this first, first chapter. Um, the fact that um, uh, Yugoslavia disappeared was that there was uh, over-experimentation uh, by Tito and his acolytes throughout the years trying to uh, satisfy the grievances of the various nations or republics, whatever you want to, to call the different elements that, that composed Yugoslavia. And in, in this over-experimentation, they decentralized uh, to great limits, I mean, great, great dimensions, so that each of our republics had a government, had a president, had a foreign minister, had a minister of agriculture, a minister of education, uh, had its own territorial army, and of course, all this meant nothing while the Communist Party was alive and there was cement holding all this at the center. Uh, the day that center disappeared, imploded with the fall of the Berlin Wall, to speak metaphorically, there were six proto-states that appeared that were unaccountable to anyone, neither internationally nor domestically. And then on top of that, of course, as, as we discussed so many times, there weren't federal elections that were held first, but elections that were held at the level of the Republic, which additionally legitimized to the, the, the power structure of, of these republics. Why did it go down this road? Well, you know, there, there, there are many, many analyses of this, how the 80s contributed to it, how uh, the fact that uh, the, uh, the grievances had been rising, you know, north, south, why should we in the north pay uh, for those in the south, the, the kind of federal budget, uh, the, the spillover of, of monies, you know, we're, we, we see that in places like Spain or in the UK with Scotland with the reverse uh, being mentioned. And in fact, the, the, uh, the eth thus uh, all this dynamic giving rise to an ethnification of politics. I remember a journalist, and maybe you all will remember who the name of the person is, was saying, you know, uh, as, as we were approaching this, this uh, fatidic 1991, who said, you, you can't say you're on the left or on the right politically, but you can say you're a Serb or a Croat. And uh, so the, the political cleavages were, were along the ethnic lines. The digging up uh, of, the, of the past, of course, which we're, we're still dealing with it, Ustasha, Chetniks, you know, uh, politicians use, use these things. And we see at every memorial moment that, uh, that uh, this, this comes up. But the fact that people uh, who had lived in a communist system in an atomized society, which was the case of other communist societies, did not have the tools of how to uh, congregate, aggregate political opinions. This was done on the hoof as, as the uh, demise began. Uh, you know, a variety of political parties were, were created or recreated from pre-World War I. Um, there were attempts at creating a Yugoslav party, Nebojša Popov, our friends, you know, in various uh, republics of Yugoslavia came together. Um, we had meetings in 1989 on issues of civil society. I remember going to Ljubljana with Zoran Džinđić and others with, uh, our, our, uh, with Tomas Masnak and, and other people to discuss how civil society can get there. So there was a lot going on, but the image that I used was that we, the liberal Democrats, to speak very simply, were, uh, were all well connected from Ljubljana to Skopje and Pristina and backwards, 
but we were floating above society. We had no anchoring into real kind of pol political, social life. And it was, of course, the power structures of the communist parties that were engaged in a power retention strategy along with their nationalistic grievances. But, you know, uh, for me, it was really about power retention where nationalism was used as a very, uh, unfortunately, efficient tool to rally around the flag and to say, well, you know, it's the fault of the Croats and vice versa, it's the fault of the Serbs. And, you know, we really have to stick together because otherwise we won't get uh, historically what, what we want. Obviously, more complicated in, in uh, many dimensions. Um, and uh, I, I won't go any further, but just to say that both in Serbia and in Croatia, the uh, uh, electoral law of choice was the, was the French, basically, the first past the post. And so you had Milosevic in 1990 winning uh, a two thirds majority in the parliament with about I don't remember exactly, 45% of the vote or, or 46. 46. Yeah. How much? 46, exactly. 46. Yeah. So with 46, he had a total control of the parliament and vice versa in Croatia. And Slavo will know the figures, uh, similar 40 something percent total control of the parliament, which very simply meant that two men called Milosevic and Tujman were con controlling their republics. And of course, we know how that, that ended. They met in Karadjojo on March 17, 1991, to on a napkin parse out and divide, and divide Bosnia. Again, many more dimensions all around that, the role of Slovenia sort of uh, leading the pack out of the country, the complete uh, disarray of the army sending tanks to the Slovenian border without any ammunition. Uh, in them, uh, you know, the image of, of the Yugoslav army tank rolling over a Fica, a Fiat 600, which went around the world and showed that it was really the, the bad guys who were, who were trying to do things. And of course, then the, the black and white picture, but we can go back to, to, to that uh, media. So um, finally, um, I, I read a variety of, of, um, of reviews of the book and many people said that my analysis is a structural analysis. Okay, I can live with that. Uh, I was uh, basically trying to explain to myself why my country disappeared in front of me. Thank you very much, Ivan. Um, should we go on to Vesna now? Okay, thank you, Anne. Well, at the time uh, we were working uh, um, on the book, there was general agreement that uh, the politics increasingly permeated by ethnic nationalism in the broader uh, geostrategic context of the end of the Cold War uh, was that explosive force that brought uh, about the end of Yugoslavia. And that uh, in, in that, the, the backdrop of a severe economic crisis, which went on for about a decade, uh, was uh, a factor that contributed to the collapse. So nationalism was a tool uh, to compete for resources. So many experts argued uh, that uh, uh, the economic situation could have been addressed had there been a way to bring political forces uh, to alignment and to agree on the reforms and how to implement them. And I, I agree in principle with, with, with that view. And certainly the first course of action uh, was to stabilize the economy, to, uh, to bring down hyperinflation, which is exactly what the last uh, government, federal government of uh, Mr. Ante Markovic did. And then there would have been a much more challenging uh, step to deal with structural imbalances in the economy. The nature of economic problems at the time required systemic changes uh, to address the consequences of economic mismanagement, which stemmed from the uh, public interference in the economic policy making under the self-management model, but also a unique external position of Yugoslavia uh, and what I mean by the extern, uh, ex, uh, exceptional uh, uh, position, external environment of Yugoslavia is the access to uh, foreign loans 
which created a perception among uh, economic fact, uh, actors and the uh, party elites uh, that there was basically an external soft budget uh, constraint. So uh, the decade of the, of the 1980s ended in stagflation, basically rampant inflation and, and uh, deterioration in, in economic growth. And at the core of it uh, was this sclerotic economic structure, in particular in that industrial sector, which was not fit to support a shift towards export-based growth needed to generate foreign currency. Now, the federal government did acknowledge that there was a problem as early as uh, early 60s, so already in, 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 in 69, uh, 61, 65 medium development plan, it aimed to reduce the dispro disproportion uh, between heavy industry and manufacturing and then in successive uh, development plan, it went even uh, further uh, in a sense, uh, trying to control, um, to shift away from, from focusing on rapid industrial growth and to, to uh, go for a sort of more balanced industrial structure. So by 1980, uh, industrial restructuring uh, was uh, defined or recognized, if you like, as an urgent economic objective and exactly in the wording of the, of the medium uh, uh, development plan uh, at the time, uh, it was said that uh, industrial restructuring uh, was, was the objective uh, on which economic and social uh, development of the country depended. So what was the problem? The problem was basically that the prolonged industrialization, uh, which never uh, reached a mature stage. Uh, so create, and it created not just an un unbalanced industrial structure, but, uh, but a, a sector, industrial sector whose manufacturing uh, part developed on imported uh, raw materials and equipment, uh, while energy and uh, 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 development of industry, of heavy industry basically lagged behind. So the whole development model which presupposed development of domestic energy and heavy industry as a base to support the manufacturing sector and in which informed uh, the Communist Party's vision of economic de development was basically scampered. Uh, because what, what, what ha happened effectively was that, except for some uh, 20 years after the World War II, while the focus was on the finessing of the political system, labor productivity was stagnating and overall economic growth was deteriorating. So in my contribution to this volume, uh, I focus specifically on the problem of stagnant economic uh, structure and, lock, and lack of technological dynamism. Uh, and it's important to, 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 uh, to re, uh, understand this because that, uh, there are very many uh, uh, analyses of sort of economic uh, causes of, of Yugoslavia's dissolution. But my, my chapter was really uh, uh, quite, quite specifically uh, focused. And I uh, uh, looked at uh, three sets of interrelated factors. Uh, basically the prevailing uh, ideology of self-managed socialism, including the ideas of solidarity uh, uh, and egalitarianism and preventing inequalities within society, which of course resulted in uh, overpriced labor and negative uh, interest rates that favored the, uh, the extensive use of these factors. Uh, and then all, all the repercussions of, of this uh, on uh, incentives and responsiveness of companies uh, to, cha to changes in domestic and foreign demand. And this, the second set of, of, of issues was the overall institutional framework, uh, basically the absence of a framework that uh, able to foster uh, efficiency. Uh, uh, self-management uh, did intend to uh, strengthen workers' incentives, but decision-making remained firmly uh, subject to political uh, influence. And then 
you know, the whole issue of, of the centralization and the evolution of, of, of economic uh, uh, powers to, to, to uh, the level of republics after 1974 uh, con constitution uh, exacerbated the problem because there was no uh, macro, federal level uh, macroeconomic uh, management framework. And the last set uh, of, of, uh, of problems that I've uh, uh, looked at was this external soft uh, budget uh, constraint, basically the access uh, to foreign, foreign uh, funds, uh, which, cre uh, which created um, uh, this debt crisis in, in, the, in the 1980s, uh, when, uh, you know, when the changes in, in American um, monetary policy uh, uh, led to the rise in interest rates. Uh, so my chapter uh, intended to speak to this uh, broad uh, theoretical debate uh, about um, development performance of centrally planned economy and the merits of a spe special version uh, of market socialism in Yugoslavia um, as one better able to integrate market principles and deliver sustained uh, growth. And I think for me, you know, what, what I really was, because before that, you know, for about a decade, I was, I was researching uh, Yugoslavia's uh, uh, self-management and I was uh, intrigued by this question of why the, this political system, which was, uh, uh, you know, uh, basically combining elements of, of, of markets which was trying to, to bring, uh, bring this economic democracy, bring the wor workers in, uh, wasn't able to provide uh, necessary institutional, uh, institutional and regulatory framework uh, for sustained long-term long growth. Basically what, what we had, but particularly after the, the 70s, was this kind of uh, weak, uh, the sur sur surrogate uh, uh, framework for, for coordination uh, of, I, which what was called smernice and, and okviri, basically instructions and, and, and basic parameters instead of concrete and implementable economic uh, policy measures. And then uh, against that, that, that uh, uh, issue, why was it that the economy wasn't really able to respond to the, uh, to the changes in external environment in the 1980s? Because one of the issues I think we, we really have to, to, to uh, uh, engage in is that so much of the analysis is uh, inward focused on, on problems of, of Yugoslavia's economic and political system. But I think the external environment, both in economic and political terms, uh, uh, was particularly uh, important or equ equally relevant, rather. So I think. Uh, where I came out uh, uh, in writing this uh, chapter uh, is that uh, self-management really worked to block the mobility of labor and capital and uh, uh, failed to, 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 uh, to stimulate uh, technological uh, progress. That uh, for all the progressive and successive economic reforms, uh, politics and economics remain uh, closely entwined, and it was simply not possible to extract the role of the party or party state, if you like, uh, uh, from, from the uh, economy. Uh, and that uh, global economic and political uh, context was also uh, of fundamental importance in, in understanding how these different components came together and created the condition for the decline of uh, Yugoslavia's economy. So I, I suppose, you know, looking back, as even even said, I don't think I would uh, disagree with a lot of what I wrote uh, wrote uh, at the time. But I'm open to counter counter arguments and, and challenges from from um, from the audience. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. That's really great. Thanks. And Slavo, would you like to take over now? Yeah, thank you very much. I was motivated to contribute to a book like uh, Ivan. I tried to explain to myself what happened. I simply uh, couldn't carry on with my life if I didn't explain to myself. 
So, uh, because I'm kind of by training some kind of economist, but I could understand clearly living through it that economics doesn't explain everything. So in this context of uh, unidimensional explanation, historically rooted hatred or um, what was uh, Vesna is telling, you know, developmental crisis, I could clearly see that these are closely interlinked things. So my kind of, uh, if you want a private theory is not private because it's published in a, in a, in a uh, book chapter, points to these three layers of the conflict. So first one is the kind of structural basis, which is the economic layer, protracted economic crisis during the 80s, but that is not sufficient for explanation. Many countries were even in a worse crisis, but didn't collapse. Second layer therefore has to be brought in, which is a political, which is the role of political elites, the whole uh, complex machinery of the self-management uh, system of a redistributive system that was uh, there. But again, for me, that doesn't explain everything because uh, uh, I make a strong distinction between the uh, disintegration of the country and collapse of the country. And I can uh, explain with the politics and economics the uh, disintegration of a country, but I cannot explain collapse. I think collapse is something which is a much more deeper. Uh, collapse is something which, when the social conflict come into your bedroom, then social fabric disappears. It's simply, and this is what we all witness. So, I, I see that kind of Yugoslav conflict as this, I, I said, unfortunate uh, coincidence of three layers, which happen to be bad at the same time. Bad economic situation, uh, political uh, situation, political elite incompetent to that. But there is a third layer, which is a kind of more anthropological for me. I'm completely amateur in that, but simply if I wanted to explain to myself, I had to bring the issue of collective memories or patriarchal culture, which comes into that context where you basically can uh, draw on the historical memories and manipulate them, you know, kind of. So uh, on, on, on these three levels, I just want to, to, to highlight what was for me strikingly um, surprising reading it after, after 25 years in this chapter. First on economic level was really surprising the, the extent to which the system was uh, parastatal the extent to which there was no kind of rule of law because there was a whole elaborate system of social compact agreements, which were basically the, the uh, meant to be uh, basis on which you run the economy. But obviously they were uh, in the context of, of that political system that was a completely voluntaristic. And that was one of the sources of the crisis. So the extent to which system was parastatal. And the second was this uh, decentralization without liberalization. And that's a shocking for me. Because usually you would assume decentralization, I have a more freedom. But if you don't liberalize at the same point, context, what do you get? You get what you get. So that was for me quite shocking reading that uh, 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 after so many years. So the, the, I want to come back to these uh, uh, kind of things, uh, um, what I've kind of um, learned or what after 30 years still holds the water, what is more general. And the things which is more general for me is this, uh, how you come to collapse of society, especially in the context where years before there was nothing which would tell you that the society will collapse. It can disintegrate, you know, country. Because I, at that time I was working in the federal government for a short period, for one year basically and half, uh, uh, trying to modernize the country. I call myself ourselves in, in the paper uh, late modernizers, or uh, government prime minister Mark, which, which came far too late into the story, kind of. But that was a kind of uh, rational discourse. So in that rational discourse, and, and uh, years before, there was nothing which would tell you that society would collapse. So how it is possible that society collapse? The only way how you can do it is through political process. You have to create the enemy. And you have to create enemy in a way that your uh, view, perception of, it, of the other changes. And what I can witness now, and I, I'm, I'm sure I'm not the only one, uh, how short time it takes to create the enemy and change perceptions. And therefore, to understand it, we have to introduce notions of uh, manufactured uncertainty, ontological insecurity. Uh, I mean, to give you an example, um, when you were traveling from place to place, you were exposed to different media, and then you would be exposed, bombarded with this kind of uh, news, uh, the same event interpreted in, in a variety of different uh, uh, perspectives, and that create complete ontological insecurity in the population. So you create that manufactured uncertainty, which is basically changes in a very short period of time, behavior of people. Suddenly something which for people was white, today becomes black. 
And then I was thinking, and this is something which for me, uh, what I am sure absolutely now after 30 years is not Yugoslav specific. This is something which we have seen across the world around. And the most recent example, actually, I wrote a blog about Brexit. And the, the, the argument is similar to the Yugoslav conflict. Because in the Brexit, you have a Brexiteers who basically have completely rational argument. And then you have a Remainer who has a rational argument. Even. And the more Remainer tries to become rational, then it basically does the opposite. And I draw the parallel to that because I saw it in, in the book, in the chapter which I've written 30 years ago, the same interpretation of the uh, Prime Minister Markovic government, which comes with a rational discourse. But that basically does exactly the opposite. You have to have, if you want to fight your rational discourse, you have to come with a different set of beliefs, which you know, will get people out of this ontological insecurity and come into another plane. So you have to come with a, politically speaking, with another kind of discourse, which maybe which has to have element of irrationality. And that's how the societies function. So I was pleased to see that at least, you know, there is something which uh, is quite general based on the Yugoslav experience. And my final point, because we said we'll be short, is what I got it completely wrong. I have at the end of the chapter, you know, idea, yes, there was this nationalism, people got crazy, this is they completely completely forgot about the others, but then as the conflict subside, there will be again rationality coming into the story. Yes, and there will be state nationalism, but this will be soft nationalism, this will be passive xenophobia, will not be active xenophobia, you know, kind of. So I predicted, you know, that this will be kind of fine uh, memories will come back from the past, and this is completely, completely naive. And if you told me, you know, 30 years ago that after 30 years today, Serbia will be actually equally poor as it was at that time, I would say you're crazy, you know, kind of. So these are things which I completely uh, misunderstood how this uh, uh, context, how the uh, politics, culture, uh, nationalism actually continue and can be basically chronic state of, 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 the, of the mind and of the economy. This is what I got completely wrong, maybe understandable from the position of a kind of young technocrats, you know, thinking in a very reductionist view on the world. So in that case, I'm talking now like an old wise man. So that's from my side. Thank you. It's very hard to be wise in the mid 90s, wasn't it? With, <laughs> with hindsight, now we see so much. But what's interesting is that you all feel that your analysis in the chapters actually still stands, your analysis of the problems. Um, we agreed that the panelists would have the first chance to ask questions and sort of join in the discussion, respond to each other. Um, so I don't know how you want to do this. Do you want to put your hand up if you want to speak, if you're on the panel or, or how would you like to do it? Yes, Ivan. Um, yeah, just some, some very quick thoughts. Um, I mean, what, you know, Yugoslavia was the exception clearly in, in so many ways. I mean, we were free to travel, you know, you could buy the Financial Times in Belgrade, uh, the curricula at the universities were more or less completely and 100% aligned with, with Western, uh, with, with exceptions, of course. Um, and, uh, but at the same time, in fact, for me, what was clear in the end and because of what happened was that we were a communist country. The backbone, uh, the backbone that held it all together was uh, a monopoly of the ideology. And uh, as, um, as I think Vesna, Vesna clearly said, I mean, you know, the economy was basically parastatal. I mean, it was all controlled. We all knew that self-management was a farce. Yeah, I mean, you know, you could decide in, in a workers' council whether the salary would be, you know, 100 dinars more or less. Uh, and so there was, uh, as we like to say among us, you know, the, the workers were thrown a bone which they could bite and, and sort of feel that they were empowered. And yeah, it, it had some uh, credits, but the, it was the political that, that was overriding. And so in the end, it was the, the fact that it was communist that, that, that broke the back. And then the other thing that is so obvious to, to all of us, uh, and I think uh, Slavo alluded to it in the end, look, we didn't have one media space. We had at least, at least seven media spaces. Uh, the main TV news was out of each of the Republic capitals. We had this, I don't know whether to call it a farce of a joint uh, news cast at 8 p.m. on a Sunday evening, where in turn Zagreb, Sarajevo and Belgrade would be the, uh, the producer of the, of the night news. And then on Monday, 
uh, evening, it would go back to, to the six or seven capitals, including uh, Pristina uh, as well. So, and then uh, as just to remind us all, because we all know this, the highway infrastructure was not to finish the highway between Belgrade and Zagreb. It was to build the highway between Zagreb and Karlovac, Ljubljana and Kranj, uh, Belgrade and Niš. And so it was the republics that were building their infrastructures and many other similar examples. So the disintegration uh, started you know, much, much earlier than, than the full disintegration and, and collapse as, as Slavo put it. And uh, absolutely, uh, as, as Slavo said, and this was part of my argument in my initial and then concluding chapter, the, the social fabric was was such uh, that people were partaking in the full Western consumerist model. And I have this lovely quote from Le Monde of the time where the journalist interviews uh, a well-off family in Sarajevo who had an optical store in Sarajevo and Belgrade. They went for skiing holidays uh, all around you know, Europe and, and you know, the Mallorcas of the world. And they said, we simply didn't, you know, engage in politics. We thought this would all be okay. And that was the kind of, you know, lollipop that uh, Yugoslavs were, were served and who were totally unaware of what the underlying political slash anthropological background that we were standing on was. I mean, there was no uh, awareness except, you know, the the kind of oppositional intellectuals from Ljubljana down to Pristina who were engaged in petition writing in the, you know, uh, I'm looking at Susan who's in the center of my screen here, uh, who, who knows this whole story from around Yugoslavia and of course those of us who were, who were part of this, uh, but that, that was it. And so the, the, the kind of the, the, the concrete structure was standing on very weak legs and, and collapsed. Can I just oh, maybe? Good question, yeah. Just a, just a quick, quick, quick one, I suppose, a reflection on on, on what both uh, Slavo and Ivan said, uh, and it um, concerns this, you know, uh, explanation of how was it that uh, nationalism um, fi found receptive audience, and how is it that that the experience of 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 life in uh, under communism, you know, disappeared so quickly or, or was, was able to be challenged so quickly. And I think uh, very often, you know, you, you find this, this, uh, this contradicting accounts of, of how population responded. On the one hand, you know, argument is that, oh, you know, there, were, there was apathy. By that point, you know, people were simply completely disengaged. But at the same time, you know, uh, the, the other, uh, uh, scholars argue, oh, you know, there was there was quite a resistance uh, to change. You know, people didn't want the change. Some people had this kind of um, allegiance to, to 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 the political and, if you like, even even economics uh, uh, system of, of former Yugoslavia uh, compared uh, compared to you know what other former former communist countries uh, were experiences. So to me, you know, it's it's. Uh, Getting a little bit more clarity on that uh, is is uh, is would be useful. You know, I don't know what both of you think think, but for me, you know, uh, there is, there is this tension. You know, where, so what what is what is the way to go about um, uh, understanding the response? You know, the, the general uh, response in, in the population to to the rise of of, of na uh, nationalism against the experience of life in Yugoslavia as it was. Was it the apathy or was it the resistance? And if it was, you know, who was, <laughs> who was, who was following uh, uh, the former and who, was, uh, who belonged to the latter camp? That's Susan. Um. These are such wonderful comments, all three of you. I'm so 
reliving this in the loveliest way, even though it's a sad story. Um, and of course, everything is all of it. The, the pieces you're showing are showing how complex it is. So I don't want to reduce anything. But the, I wanted to make two comments. One, well, three. One, in terms of what Ivan said at the beginning, one element of what he says, the leaders were into power retention using nationalism. I am speaking from the United States right now. There's no better example of what's going on with what the Republican Party is doing to destroy our democracy in order to retain power. So to a certain extent, this is not just a Yugoslav story. And I think it's important to put that into context. The, the second piece I wanted to say with Ivan's story um, of the, um, the people in Sarajevo who had this eyeglass story, forgetting what you're saying. Um, one of my most painful memories of all, it, it's not violent, so you would say, why is that most painful? But um, I went to Sarajevo in, at the end of January, 1992, just for two days, because those of us in Washington were beginning to really worry what was going to happen in Bosnia. And I was even had to go by way of Belgrade. I was at Davos, so I was in Europe. Um, I had to go by way of Belgrade. I was given an opportunity to meet Milosevic. And I said, far more important to me was to go to Sarajevo. So I didn't meet Milosevic. And I went there and, and a group of friends of mine from Croatia, they were um, Saralia, but I, the connection for me was from friends in Zagreb. And they were people who were of all of the um, ethnic, ethno-national identities in Yugoslavia who went to high school together and used to get together for dinner every Friday night just to be together. But they had stopped because the economic situation was so bad, none of them could afford it and they didn't want to embarrass each other. But for me, they said, we're going to do this again. And we had a lovely evening talking about how wonderful it was to be Bosnian and everyone shared this. So they were totally oblivious to what was happening within the next month. I went back and saw them when I was working for UNBRA4 in, in June 1994, and they gathered together. Happily, they were all there. And they said, Susan, we didn't believe you. And you were right. And the third piece I wanted to say with Vesna, um, in her elegant analysis of the very complex situation, did refer to the soft budget constraints that Yugoslavia had because of US support. That is to say that the IMF and the World Bank starting in 1950 kept it alive. And others we could you know, elaborate. Um, and I think the fact that that then disappeared for Ante Markovic, it's more part of my chapter, so I won't go on, but I think it's important to keep that in mind. Great. Okay, uh, Safed? Yeah, I think um, for me, crucial thing is the, uh, that the intensity of collapse cannot be explained by the scale of economic and even political troubles. And all the time, for me, is really the more time passes this distinction between country disintegrating, fine. I mean, when I was in the government there, I, we actually worked on the, on the program in my area of uh, Yugoslavia, like future EU, you know, kind of, because you have a rational discourse, so you, you accept that, you know, kind of. So that's not the problem, you know, kind of. Uh, and and uh, uh, that is a qualitatively different from the collapse, and collapse cannot be explained by the scale of the economic and political troubles, however, you know, significant they were. I mean, we can have the, the whole session just on, on the scale of the trouble, but the collapse of society cannot be explained by that. Uh, I think that one has to bring the, 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 the other element, which is the completely, um, I don't know whether the Yugoslav conflict was new in that uh, respect. Um, you know, after that, uh, I could see that around before that I, I was blind to that. And that is the fact that the reality uh, is not just a, a result of your direct human experience, but reality is basically um, the information itself around. And for me, the, the collapse came in that period of, of basically uh, producing enemies where horror after horror comes. You, you wake up every day, there is a bad news. 
next day is the worst news. Third day is the worst news. So every single day, news is the worst and worse. What is your natural reaction when the news is worse and worse? You are looking to escape somewhere. You are looking somewhere where you have some ontological security. Where is that? That is with your tribe. That is the only way how you can explain that uh, uh, couples, you know, marriages break up. And this is for me fundamental to explain the collapse. Why? Because if there was no collapse, if there was a, if there was a disintegration, we would be talking on a completely different terms about the situation today in the region. And I think the economic situation today after 30 years would have been very much different because there will be a basis for the rational discourse. But when you produce enemy, because this was the only way how you can retain the power. And that is for me, the, the, the Susan, you, you say, yes, uh, uh, nationalism is used. But imagine if you use in US to that extent, it basically it leads to collapse of society. That is qualitatively uh, you know, different category. From that point, there is no way back. I mean, you are then in a completely dark territory. How collapsed society can, can reconstruct itself? Because even the new unit has to establish itself in some kind of way that it can communicate internationally. But if I look at it from, from my experience now, you know, kind of, I, I work something on Serbia as a consultant now, and I can see the whole this generation Milosevic type, which was brought up in a closed system. And they basically are lost in space for me, you know, kind of. And this is the result of the collapse. This is not the result of, of disintegration. So that's my addition to that, to reinforce the Slavo, could I just say, happily, you're not living in the United States right now. But we're have, but, but I think you're wrong that it isn't of the same level. We have violent gangs just entering, the, the, trying to stop the, the voting, the, you know, destroy the Constitution all over the country right-wing militias I could go on but it's it can have that trajectory isn't just the mm -hmm. one in Yugoslavia yeah and I I just want to make a, a, a small point on what Slavo has just said I absolutely agree I mean there is uh, at, at that level it's just uh, it's it goes beyond um, you know your experiences also what what you what you are exposed to in terms of, of information and you know how it put, creates animosity and and uh, tension and all that but uh, at the same time you know there is a very uh, clear and palpable uh, sort of material side to it if you look back uh, at the rate of unemployment and deteriorating unemployment the rise of of, of national parties ethnic parties and how you know jobs started being kind of people started being moved from their posts because of, of they were of certain um, identity. So all that together over time, I think, created that that uh, uh, that situation where this collapse level you're talking about became possible. So you know it's it's really the, the material and 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 ideological and psych, uh, uh, psychological. A dynamic that converge and make this collapse possible? My answer to that would be, this is a necessary condition, Vesna, but this is not sufficient condition. There must be something else into the story to produce collapse. Otherwise, you have countries like Ukraine in a terrible crisis for a long period of time, you know, until the, the, the recent meddling from outside, you know, kind of, uh, countries do not necessarily disintegrate within, just based on economics. Just no, I'm not saying that. based on uh, on economics, but it play uh, solely on on so on material. No, absolutely not. It's just yeah. what I'm saying is that the combination of, of all these things yeah. make the collapse possible. I mean yeah, that yeah. that's how you. Yeah, yeah. Just, just very briefly, uh, a, a small uh, point that uh, Amatria Sen's book on identity and violence, I think, is revealing in a number of dimensions. It doesn't explain Yugoslavia, but you can see how how this whole thing starts uh, like a tornado and leads to, to the kind of violence that, that we have seen. An important point, and I think I'm sure we'll come back to it, but I just want to uh, table it, is the whole issue of confronting the past and how it was dealt with or rather not dealt with after 1945 in Yugoslavia for the sake of peace at home. And uh, a lot of things were swept under the carpet uh, the the whole uh, story of Diana Budisavljevic is very interesting. 
and why all her books with all the names of the Serb children that she saved suddenly disappeared in 1945, things like that. And I, I think there was this, uh, this kind of Hail Mary wish that if we don't talk about it, we'll some, somehow get over the hump. We nearly did in Yugoslavia, you know, had, the, had communism collapsed 10 years later, maybe we would have avoided the collapse, maybe there would have been disintegration, but all the worst memories of the past and I think we can compare it if, if uh, uh, it's useful to compare it to Spain, where after the death of Franco, all the parties from the communists to the monarchists and right decided not to touch, not to touch the civil war history. That was out of bounds because they knew and they're, if I may say, they're just as ir irrational to use a nice word as we are because when you're in Spain and you scratch just the surface, you will get all the stories of who killed whom and why. But here, the, the nationalists, our, our leaders, our communist leaders invoked this bad past. And that is why, and Slav is absolutely right, there was in ontological insecurity. The great fear came upon us all. And that's, you know, we had the kind of behavior that we did. I wonder if now we could bring in the other participants because I think that we've heard a lot of very interesting points from the panelists, but maybe some of the other people on this Zoom call would like to say something. Could you just write it very quickly in the chat, perhaps? Um, My question will be, will be really brief. Uh, we, you reminded us already of many causes of that particular type of disintegration. But something important was missing, at least for, from, from my point of view. And in order to, to get to that, we can probably compare uh, the recent case of Catalan secession attempt. Now, there you have nationalism, which Slavo branded equally irrational as a uh, Southeast European type of nationalism. There you have democracy at the same time. And something else which was missing, and that was the international support for disintegration or the interest of someone else in the country being disintegrated. I imagine France arming and training Catalan separatists. And I wonder what would have happened. So th this question is... Uh, uh, directed to anyone on the panel. So whoever feels uh, the urge to have to answer it, I'll, I'll be really grateful to hear the answer. Thank you. I think you, you'll have Susan talking about it. You'll get your answer in a minute. It's, she's much better placed to talk about it, at least from, from my, my, my perspective. But I think you, you've got the point because uh, I was always thinking if in 1992, um, there was some kind of international agreement whereby you would put on Bosnian borders uh, peacekeepers, that that would really contribute a lot to, to uh, reduction of tensions. But saying that, I have to now, first time publicly, um, say that, um, um, during the night, uh, later on, much after the war, I, I had an informal chat in Sarajevo. We had a dinner with Prime Minister Markovic, and then uh, what came clearly there, uh, he told me that basically he didn't know, government didn't know that uh, uh, paramilitaries were already kind of were given uh, weapons across Croatia and Bosnia. So even by that time, I think this UN peacekeepers would have come too late. Uh, so mm -hmm. the, the, the scene, the, the stage was already set. So that basically that, that whatever followed there was, was already structurally prepared kind of, kind of, so to say it, it all came far too late for, even for any international kind of intervention. Oh, don't forget that Yugoslavia was the first one. After that, you know, interventions follow. So this is a kind of also something which, uh, um, you know, we were the first, unfortunately. If we were second, it would have been different. If I, if I can just add two words uh, to, to what Slavo, uh, said, um, well, first of all, something that's been obvious uh, to me uh, is, uh, is that this is self-inflicted. 
what happened is self-inflicted. We started this mess. We were unable to stop it. And uh, the internationals then came to try and, you know, salvage it or, or make peace. You know, Lord Carrington's conference will get it all into that. But uh, the reason is that because we, we did it. And this is where the structure comes in. Again, these, there were, these were six proto-states that appeared suddenly. The territorial defense is not innocuous in this thing. So everybody had their army and they were already, as, as Slava said, I mean, it was clear that, you know, Slovenes, Croats, et cetera, all the others were using the depots of, of weapons that they had to arm themselves. And then there was all, of course, that famous uh, video on Belgrade TV of, of Hungarian trucks with, uh, with weapons coming in uh, in into to Croatia. And uh, we have all the trappings of, of you know, in, in, in Catalonia, uh, Brexit, uh, Slavo was right to mention, I've made that argument, you know, taking back control is, is a kind of, uh, is, a, is a loose translation of Svojna Svome, Milosevic's slogan. Basically, if we take control of ourselves, you know, we, we will be better off, but we can get back uh, to that. But I, I still maintain that the fact that uh, Spain is a democratic country, and that they are, you know, we can discuss how successful or not, they are trying to mitigate the demands of, of the Catalans. And we can look into why the Basques who were even more violent have subsided and are not asking what the Catalans are doing. And of course it helps to be a member of the European Union and NATO, uh, but I think it's, it's primarily the fact that, uh, you know, the fact that, uh, that the prime minister of Spain has now liberated these guys from prison I, I maintain that the democratic institutional framework is, is important in this. Thank you. Um, I think maybe, can we just take the one more question which was in the chat? And I think we should answer that first and then we'll go on to the next panel. So Stephen Doswell asked about the role of the 1974 constitution in leading to the demise of Yugoslavia. We'll need another three hours. <laughs> Uh, Susan, do you want to say something about that? Tell him to read my first book, I, <laughs> because the, this idea that it begins in 74 is completely factually wrong. It begins in 5052 in one way, but certainly with 1958 in the terms of decentralization as membership in the GATT, and it goes on at every stage, but, you, but as Ivan says, it would take three hours to go through the details. That just you agree one, to, just sorry, one yeah. anecdote to, to confirm uh, uh, what Susan said. Uh, my father was at some party reunion in 1960, I believe, or 61, and Edvard Kardel asked him, uh, so what are your children? And my father said, what do you mean, what, what are my children? Well, how did they I identify? Well, they're, they're Yugoslavs. I mean, I'm from a mixed family. And Calde said, uh, that's not good. They should, you know, you should be thinking in terms of republic um, identity. And it's in the book of, of this interview book, my father um, yeah, published in Zagreb. Silva, Silva Mejnaric, the sociologist from Croatia, did some wonderful work on um, Cardell's writings already starting in the 1920s. His aim was very, very clear, and he didn't hide behind any bushes. Okay, well, thanks. Perhaps on that note, we could um, move on now, shall we, to our next panel, which is that part of the book, which is called In the Eye of the Storm. Um, and we have two people who contributed to that part with us today, uh, Xavier and Susan. And I think Xavier should go first since his contribution is first in the book. So, sorry for that. Uh, well, uh, my presentation will be a little different from the, the, the first ones. Uh, first of all, I was afraid when preparing this uh, talk that I would be too long. And now I'm afraid I will be too, too brief. <laughs> but anyway, um, in my chapter, um, my contribution to the book, I put a strong emphasis on uh, religious and national communities in Bosnia and Herzegovina and on the commun communitarian nature of Bosnian society. And 
25 years later, I still believe that you cannot understand Bosnia and Herzegovina without taking into account these religious and national communities. But I think also that you cannot understand Bosnia and Herzegovina if you don't take into account other kinds of social identities. For example, the rural urban relations and cleavages in Bosnian society, the class identities, um, those who have survived the war and those who have disappeared during the war and after the war, or you have to take into account also social groups uh, that were produced by the war, the displaced persons, the war veterans, the civil victims, and so on. I'm, for example, very surprised and disappointed that there is no one monography about war veterans in Bosnia and Herzegovina or in Croatia. The, uh, the war veterans have completely disappeared from the interest of the academic community. And that's, a, in my opinion, a big mistake because war veterans are very important actors, not only in Bosnia and Herzegovina, but also in Croatia or in Kosovo. So I will, um, I will put a stronger emphasis on other dimensions than the religious and ethnic dimension of Bosnian society. Um, my chapter finished with the Dayton Agreement. And of course it was written uh, shortly after the end of the war and it was at that time not very clear what will happen in the next few months or in the next few years. Now we know that the Dayton Agreement uh, have provided a more or less lasting and stable peace to Bosnia and Herzegovina. And that's the good side of this agreement. Uh, the Dayton Agreement has also provided to Bosnia and Herzegovina a legal existence in the sense that Bosnia and Herzegovina is now a recognized state uh, internationally. And also that Bosnia and Herzegovina has at least some common institutions institutions common to both entities of Bosnia and Herzegovina. But I think that I was right in saying that uh, the Dayton Agreement will lead to the disintegration of Bosnia and Herzegovina more than to its reintegration. Because now, uh, after 25 years, we see how Bosnian society is still deeply divided on a national uh, level, but also on other levels. Uh, for example, the, the divide between people who have remained in their place of living during the war and people who have moved during the war, the cleavages between both groups are also very present in Bosnian society. What I would add about the Dayton agreements today is that um, the mistake of the Dayton agreements, what not only to uh, recognize the territorial partition of Bosnia and Herzegovina, but also that the, um, the American project uh, linked with the Dayton agreements was in my opinion that the American diplomats uh, were expecting that the political and economical transition in Bosnia and Herzegovina would lead to the creation of new political elites and the new political elite will be able to renegotiate the agreement and to renegotiate a new institutional framework, more stable and more rational. It didn't happen. Uh, we had in Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, free elections, the first ones in 1996. And we have also, we had also in Bosnia and Herzegovina the introduction of market economy, we had a privatization in Bosnia and Herzegovina, but this did not, these processes did not lead to a change of political elites. The political elites that led the war in Bosnia and Herzegovina have profited from uh, the transition rather than they were uh, marginalized by the economical and political transition. And the, the final result is clientelism and corruption which are maybe more important factors in Bosnian political life than nationalism itself. So here again, I will re re um, relativize the importance of nationalism and ethnic belonging. 
Um, the, 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 the third point I, I would like to stress is that we are now talking about Bosnia as a Govina mainly as a post-communist and a post-war country. And it, it, it is true that Bosnia and Herzegovina is both a post-communist and a post-war country, but it is not only that. Um, you imagine that, for example, somebody in 1970 had defined the French society as a post-war society. It would have been ridiculous. Uh, and uh, 25 years have uh, uh, have followed after the war in Bosnia and Herzegovina, and a lot of things that are happening in Bosnia and Herzegovina are neither linked with communism nor with the war. I will take a, a few examples uh, the development of social networks in Bosnia and Herzegovina, like everywhere in the world, the development of tourism from the Arab Gulf country. Um, the, the, the strong immigration of Bosnian citizens, but also the immigration of refugees from the Middle East in Bosnia and Herzegovina. The pandemic itself are factors in Bosnia and Herzegovina, important factors that are neither linked to the communist heritage, to the heri communist legacy, nor to the war itself. And if we continue to define Bosnia and Herzegovina only as a post-communist and post-war country, we will miss a lot of uh, changes that are happening today in Bosnia and Herzegovina. That's it. Thank you very much indeed. That was a very salutary reminder that we, we have to be careful about overstating the, the impact or maybe the, the relevance today of the war, not seeing it everywhere. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Um, let's go on to Susan now, and then after that, we'll have the panel discussion. I wanted to begin by thanking Ivan for reminding us the, the important role that David Diker played in this book, and to say how sad it is he's no longer with us. And, um, and also to say I'm sad about Milos Vasic not wanting at least to be, have a reunion. But anyway, it's his choice. Um, I actually was surprised in rereading my chapter um, at how much I still agreed with it. I, I couldn't find anything that I disagreed. Ivan has already said that has been true for most of us and it was, but it was a surprise for me. Um, and secondly, I was surprised at how of the more than I wish to say times I have had to be to write some analysis of what happened in a brief way in a chapter. Um, how many have I done 15, 20 since 1991? That this may be one of the best. <laughs> so, so I was pleased at that. In terms of the role of external actors, I'm not saying of the whole Yugoslav crisis. But in my case of the IMF, the World Bank, the European Union, the United States, especially. Um, I also wanted to say that the, my chapter reminded me of what sometimes I have forgotten because it was so long ago. Um, although Marie Janine Kalik was saying this the other day, um, which is to remember that what was happening in Yugoslavia was happening at the same time, literally, as an international transition was going on. The end of the Cold War, the European Union, Maastricht, we can go on at, at, at length about all the things that were happening simultaneously. At the time in my chapter, I asked, will the Yugoslav case contribute to a redefinition of the international order because of its role in this international transition? I don't think it has. But I do think it's an interesting question to ask why not? Why did it have so little influence, in my view, on what has happened internationally since 1991? I admit I was sad to be reminded in so much detail of what I knew then and know now, but to be reminded um, of the declining support for the federal government by every external actor. Washington, both the president and the Congress, 
the European Community, the European Free Trade Association, the Council of Europe, NATO, the Conference on Security and Economic Cooperation in Europe, I mean, CSCE, um, all of them withdrew support for the federal government. And simultaneously at the same time, they were supporting the Slovene argument, treating Slovenia as a separate state, not just a proto-state as Ivan was saying was happening at the time, but a real sovereign state giving it all the powers, treating it as that actor. So in other words, what the external actors were doing is they were shaping the outcome and they were certainly ratifying the breakup, if not more. Many people say they do it, especially for Bosnia Herzegovina, but they say it generally um, that on the international side, external actors, there was too little too late. I think if anyone reads my chapter, rereads it, you can see that that's simply wrong. There was plenty of action. The problem was the absence of a common strategy. Everyone was doing their own thing. So, what it, but it was making things much, much worse. Whatever the possibilities for a compromise at the time, um, and that's something we haven't talked about today yet, um, if the parties, the Republican leaders have been forced to find a compromise, all of that was out the window because of the role of the external actors. I also argued there and I still think it's true that there, was, there appeared to be very little capacity by the external actors, all of them, for learning. Even, you know, we were all writing in the end of 1995, so we had four or five years to go. No learning was taking place at all. Um, and I end the chapter by saying that there was an absence of new frameworks. Um, I mentioned Marie Janine Kalik because two weeks ago she and I were on a discussion for Radio Free Europe about all these issues that we're talking about today. And she was saying the same thing that at the time in her argument, the external actors had no instruments to deal with Yugoslavia, but that she thinks that now new instruments have been developed so that the situation would have unraveled in very different ways. I don't agree with her, but it's another issue that I think it's important to have a discussion or debate about. And finally, um, my prediction at the end, the last couple of two pages on what was at that point, just the Dayton agreement, as Xavier has already told us, we didn't yet see how it would play out. My prediction, turns out to have been completely correct. I'm very sad to say. I was arguing about how all of the mistakes of Yugoslavia constitutionally, of the role of the IMF and the World Bank, of the role of the EU, of the role of the United States. Um, I could go on at length. All of the mistakes that we could, I, I call them mistakes in the sense of what, uh, as potential causal elements in the, in the what Slavo has called the collapse of Yugoslavia, all of them applied as a result of the Dayton Agreement and the external role of external actors since. I think Xavier's point that we should stop analyzing um, Bosnia-Herzegovina today in terms of the Dayton Agreement and certainly in terms of what it, in the literature is called post-conflict and post-war, I completely agree with him and I do wish um, I think there's a little bit on war veterans in the sense of recognizing the, how important they are, but you're absolutely right, Xavier, there's no monograph um, in Bosnia, Kosovo, Croatia, as you said. So I think, well, what we need to do, at least now in Bosnia and Herzegovina, is what he has suggested, is to look at how much has changed, how much the political leaders are still doing exactly what they got away with, in Yugoslavia in the 80s, but how much social change has taken place and to begin to assess what that means for what most of us think of, uh, most of us think of economically and politically as an utter stalemate, but not a stalemate in terms of what's going on on the ground. And I think that's a wonderful conclusion to draw 
from this section of the book. Thank you, Susan. Uh, okay, who among the panelists would like to respond to what Xavier and Susan have just said? Uh, Ivan. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take a, a quick shot uh, at this. Um, on Bosnia, what I've said many times to people who are saying, you know, Dayton is this uh, thing invented by American State Department lawyers uh, who, who drafted it, you know, the response is, my response has always been, look, Dayton was not plucked out of the air. And I think Xavier's chapter explains very well. And I, that's why I've kind of shared it widely with, with people who didn't know the first thing about, about Bosnia. There, there is a history of to put it all too simply, consociationalism, you know, from Ottoman times to Austro-Hungarian times, a very intricate power sharing uh, a mechanism under communism, you know, in turn, uh, directors of, of high schools had to be Serb, Croat, Bosniak, uh, let alone the, the high levels of, of the party and, and state, uh, Bosnian state uh, organism. So, um, I, I talked to, to, to a professor who grew up with my mother in Sarajevo. Uh, she was born there and uh, I tried to capture some of his uh, sort of the history of, of pre-war Sarajevo. And he told me, I said, how come you ended up in Belgrade? He said, well, he was a, a professor of chemistry. And he said, I applied for a job. Uh, this is early 60s in Sarajevo. His simple response from, from, the, from the university, from the faculty of, of chem chemistry was, we already have too many Serbs on, on the faculty. There's, you know, we need to balance out here. So this is this is not new. It, it stems and, you know, of course, Xavier can say much more. Uh, for those of you who don't know Xavier, uh, I met him back. Uh, he did his French civil military service by teaching French in Belgrade and go off to Bosnia every weekend. And I think he knows every nook and cranny of the country and met every religious group and sect uh, that he could, so he knows what he's talking about. Um, uh, so I learned very much from him when when we were there in 89, 1990, and it helped me understand understand many things. So I think that's that's crucial to understand. Clientelism and corruption, definitely. I mean, that's everywhere. Um, one aspect that I just uh, want to flag that maybe we should mention a little later is the is the demographic decline. The dem dramatic demographic decline that all of our countries are, are witnessing. I mean, the, 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 the population has shrunk in, in all of these countries, Croatia, Serbia, Bosnia. And I think it's, it's an element that we need to take into account when we look you know, where, where these uh, uh, places are going. And to Susan, absolutely. I mean, the, the, we've always talked about the disjointed voices of the various international actors and pleaded, you know, can you speak with one voice as we, you know, got into the 90s, because the Milosevic's of this world were playing the international community and slaloming through their, through their differences. And of course, the famous visit of, of James Baker and then Jacques Delors to Belgrade, you know, kind of last ditch attempt offering, I don't know what it was, three, four billion uh, dollars or, or, or so. And uh, no, it, it was, you know, we had gone too far for for this to uh, to help. I think the 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 realization was, um, you know, maybe it was better to keep it, but it couldn't be done anymore, and so simply they they let it go. Thank you, uh, Susan. Just a small point on what Ivan has just said. Um, those monies that they were offering in the spring of um, 1991 still came with the same conditions of the IMF and World Bank programs that he had to do all these series of economic reforms, which was had already, you know, Vesna has already told us what, what the consequences were, what, whatever one's, however one wants to assign blame, the consequences were clear. So it, it wasn't saying, Here's money to stay together. It's here money. Here's money to keep doing your economic reform program. <laughs> okay. Um, did anyone else on the panel want to come in at this point? Vesna, did you have a hand up? 
I'm just intrigued by something that uh, uh, both Susan and Javier say, said in their in the, um, chapters, actually, maybe not so much in, in, in their presentation, which is about the internationals uh, speaking with particular interlocutors on, on, on the domestic side. I mean, they spoke with sort of big man, the man who mattered, and to the extent that anybody else was included in a conversation, that was an aside. So how would you explain that? I mean, it also, it links, links um, also to uh, what Susan was saying about this lack of capacity of the international actors to learn. So for me, one of the lessons uh, of what went wrong was the failure to really genuinely consult and, and engage with, with other actors. I'd like to come in on that. Susan, do you want to say something again? Well, I do want to hear what Javier has to say. Um, unfortunately, Vesna, this is standard diplomatic practice. Just, you know, look at Afghanistan, look at Iraq, look at, you know, this is, they, the, they only want to talk to the people who they think have military power. And I, I do remember very much, you may have involved in this, there were some groups, um, civil society groups, I'm forgetting the name of someone who was at Sussex, but a Serb. Anyway, they were organizing in terms of the negotiations for Bosnia to go to Geneva when the negotiations were continuing under the Geneva conference um, with Owen and, and Vance at that point, and then Owen and Stoltenberg, to get voices, not from the people who were running the guns, but from, from civil society actors with alternatives. And they were told explicitly, we're not interested in talking to you. That's not how we, how, how we end conflict, war, whatever the phrase they were using. And it just, I mean, it's not that it, we haven't all been telling them that was completely wrong in every single instance of civil war intervention that I know of since at least 1990, but they still continue it. Javier, what would, what would you say, Xavier? Well, um, I think that uh, as you said, it's a common diplomatic practice. Um, and I don't know whether uh, the international community could have been uh, strengthening uh, the civic forces in Bosnia Herzegovina. But I mean, the main point uh, is that uh, by not lifting the, the arm embargo toward Bosnia Herzegovina, uh, the UN has uh, um, rendered possible the fact that this embargo will be lifted by Iran and other Muslim countries. And this lifting of the embargo by uh, Muslim countries have reinforced the SDA networks within the army. If the, if the embargo had been lifted by the UN, the, the, the arms had gone to the regular Bosnian army that was at the beginning at least under influence also of civic parties and not um, to the uh, informal and SDA network. So the, the, the arm embargo and its uh, lifting by the Muslim countries have contributed to reinforce the, uh, the influence of the SDA within the army. Uh, as I said, uh, if the embargo has been lifted by the UN, then the providing of weapons have could have been done with the regular institutions and the regular army in Bosnia Herzegovina. And that's the main difference. Maybe it's more important than talking with representatives of, of civil society. I have a question for uh, Susan and, and for Xavier. Um, Susan, you mentioned this uh, Dayton project and then expectation of American uh, politicians, uh, negotiator, that this will basically lead to new process, there will be new political elite, uh, which will then lead to changes of the framework. I mean, that's for me, even I myself at that time was thinking the same. You know, this is a short term solution. Politics is always about short term solutions. This will open new dynamics, but at the same time, that dynamic didn't happen, you know, kind of. So, of course, the 
completely different issue is why they didn't happen. But what is then kind of from your knowledge of the, of the global politics um, a response on such kind of frozen situations? Does it mean that basically until something doesn't change in the global context, that's how it will stay? Or um, there is any alternative? If it is not, then that leads me to the other question, which is for, for Xavier, which is the related to this, where the change will come from. Because I think in this uh, session today, we should also talk about the, 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 the current situation or future. And you uh, just gave us hints of some of the processes which are going on today, starting from uh, Arab tourist uh, immigration, immigration. Um, you know, there are lots of things on a, on a, on a bottom-up level, so to say which uh, may lead maybe to changes and maybe they will generate demand for a change of political framework. In which direction? That's for me kind of a million dollar question. So do you have kind of any inclination or, or thinking, what is your thinking on that? How these processes which are taking place now, uh, kind of how they may affect this uh, uh, broader uh, political framework in Bosnia? Uh, Susan or? Yeah, I'll begin. Um... Slavo, that argument of the assumptions that the Americans were making was something that Ivan said. I didn't say that. Um, I think the issue about the Dayton Accord for the Americans is two things. One, that they were just following, you know, this was the seventh peace agreement proposed for Bosnia Herzegovina. Each one before that, the Americans said no to. And most importantly, the Vance Owen plan in January 92, when Clinton was just becoming president, he hadn't even been inaugurated yet, but he, his voice on, on whether to accept the Vance Owen plan was definitive. And it was Richard Holbrook who said, don't, don't sign it because it rewards the Serbs too much. And then he ends up actually, as many would say at the time, rewarding the Serbs for the Dayton Agreement but four years more of, or three and a half years more of horrid war. But I don't think, I mean, other than the fact that the Dayton Agreement is more or less built on the, every one of the previous agreements, um, I don't myself think, plus State Department people, as Ivan has said, who really had, didn't have a clue about Bosnia. I know those people, they didn't know anything. Um, and, and it's not as if they didn't have people around them you know, many American scholars who knew a great deal about Bosnia, just to take the Americans since this was the State Department. Um, they just, they didn't listen. They didn't care. Why? Because the only thing they cared about was that Clinton not lose the midterm elections in October. And so if he could figure out a way to stop the fighting, didn't matter what the political outcome in the long term was, it's just let's stop the fighting. Um, and the second part of that is, um, I think um, Glikorov is the best on this because um, he's made it very explicit in his analyses of external analysis, um, support for de economic development in Bosnia that it was never about development. It was always about security, namely European security. So if we look at what outsiders have been doing for at least in Bosnia, other than the IMF and World Bank with its ideological project um, to maintain the international financial institutions, it's all been about containment. It's not about economic development. It's not about democracy. It's not about all the things that we um, say. It's just, you know, keep a lid on this. If necessary, we'll have an over the horizon force from NATO, we'll go back in if any violence starts. But otherwise, that's all we care about. Well, to, to answer to Slavo, um, I first have to say that I'm not uh, um, following uh, the political life in Bosnia and Herzegovina anymore. I'm now working on historical topics like the Second World War. Um, and I stopped uh, following the political and social situation in Bosnia and Herzegovina because uh, there is no hope in Bosnia and Herzegovina, in a sense. Um, I was in Sarajevo a few weeks ago after two years not being in Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, due to the pandemic. 
and nothing has changed. The, the politicians are always talking the same things, and it, it can last decades and decades. What I what I'm afraid about is that the next time there is a big change in the European political order, it will lead to war in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, I don't know how and when this grand, this big transformation of the European geopolitical order will happen, but the next time it happens, there will be a new war in Bosnia and Herzegovina. That's my opinion. You know, I would like just to add, um, Xavier, Marie Janine Kalik, you know, she's written these two books recently about Yugoslav, Yugoslavia historically. And she argues that the, the borders, the drawing of borders in the form, area of former Yugoslavia is not yet complete. So I'm, I'm, I'm sort of scared by what you say, but I think it's, we certainly have evidence that you could be right. Ivan. Uh, yeah, I mean, what I what I've learned uh, from seeing uh, my country uh, disappear is that I'm very cautious about uh, predictions, and uh, I'm an optimist by nature, so I'm now an extremely cautious uh, optimist. Um, I I don't think uh, we'll see a war in the next ten to twenty years. You know, as Kane said, we're all dead in the long run, so uh, it won't matter what happens after that. But um, we did war in the 90s, and the, the memories of war in the heads of politicians and people are still very much there. You know, a Dodi can play with rhetorical fire about separation and all this, uh, but he is the last one that, that will go to war because they know that it spells the end, the end for them. So we're... we're uh, we're, you know, walking the edge in, in certain situations, all these non-papers that talk about, you know, new drawing of borders. I mean, the, the whole breakdown of Yugoslavia, as you will remember, people talked about the unfinished work of Versailles conference, that, you know, the Versailles should have dealt with this, so we had to wait 100 years for it to be done. So I don't see a, a I don't know whether 20 years is midterm or, or whatever it is, I, I don't see that happening. What I see is stagnation. Uh, in my kind of uh, cautious, optimistic book, uh, and I guess the European Union will survive in my book, is that uh, when uh, Serbia and all the other sort of uh, Kosovo Serbia are resolved, then Bosnia falls into place last. Many of us who are from the former country always said that, that Bosnia will, will be solved, if that's the right word, last of all. I mean, Kosovo is simpler much simpler than, than Bosnia, if we speak in those very simplistic terms. Um, they have a, a very cozy arrangement in Bosnia, you know, clientelism, corruption. They, you know, meet in, in the back rooms of cafes and, and agree on a variety of things. Uh, that, that's not good at all. I mean, the people of Bosnia suffer and, and there is this outflow, again, democratic outflow, uh, outflow of people of, of young people and um, and decline and aging of population. So, you know, I remember being in a in a briefing in Washington at the Defense Intelligence Agency. Uh, this was maybe ten years ago, and the person said, "We calculate then that the population of Bosnia is 3.3 million." Uh, I guess we're we're around that that number. Uh, uh, you know, whether it's 3.5 or 3.4, uh, Vesta maybe knows more about uh, the, these numbers, but yeah, they, you know, Serbia's population is now below 7 million, Croatia's is probably below 4 million. So these are elements that will, that will play a role. Could I just come in quickly? Because I don't know if you saw that there was a question in the chat um, put there during the break by Nicholas Seals about this business about elite turnover. And he asks whether the patrimonial local elites will continue to hold sway in former Yugoslav republics. And Savier has already said that they do in Bosnia, but then he also points to, for example, Croatia and asks about emerging new um, political parties and social movements that might actually be a force for change. I don't know if anybody on the panel would like to respond to that. Well, I can, and talk about Bosnia-Herzegovina. 
Um, also, as I said, I'm not following closely the political life in Bosnia and Herzegovina, but the last local elections uh, were a small sign of uh, hope because the uh, nationalist parties were defeated in the biggest cities in Sarajevo, in Banja Luka, and in Mostar. But there were already in, in the post-war period some other signs uh, for optimism. Uh, maybe you remember in 2000, the Alliance for Change was elected in Bosnia-Herzegovina, and there was, at least in the Federation, and there, there were uh, many hopes linked with this Alliance for Change, and at the end, two years later, it was very disappointing. We, have, we had this uh, forum movement in 2014, and again, this movement uh, around the forums in Tuzla and in other towns broke a lot of hope, um, and at the end, there was nothing. It was very disappointing also, so I'm rather cautious about uh, uh, what the new municipalities in Sarajevo, in Banja Luka, and Mosta will be able to do to um, to fight against nationalism in Bosnia and Herzegovina, and to fight against corruption as well. If I can just come in briefly yeah. as well, um, I think uh, you know both uh, both of you said um, it's wrong to or no, no longer useful to, to analyze the region or, or Bosnia in particular in terms of uh, post, post transition, post conflict societies. Uh, but I think the legacies of conflict are still there. They're very, very, very obvious and, and very entrenched. And I think it goes to, to, towards answering the question from, from the audience. Uh, so, and the, one of those legacy, uh, legacies are the actors. I mean, we, you know, we have a generation, we have some continuity in, in some cases, literally the same people, or you just look at the Bosnian Croat side or uh, Bosnian Serb uh, side uh, in terms of the elites who've been there for, for a very long time and, 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 their, and their networks. Then you have also the continua continuation of, of these ideologies, illiberal ideologies that despite all this, um, moments of, 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 of hope of, of, for prog progressive change, as uh, we just heard. Uh, now, actually, it is allowed, uh, and not, nothing, nothing substantial happens in, in terms of, of changing, uh, changing the, the, the outlook for the region. And I think also one of the legacies is this, this problem of, of weak governance, which is due to this uh, clientelist uh, uh, patronage uh, uh, practices that still survive in the region, which are also very much part of, of, of conflict legacies. And this is why it's so, it's so difficult, uh, difficult to, to turn around these societies and to see you know, where, this, uh, where this progressive uh, change can come from. Because even, you know, and, and that goes then against this, uh, this still uh, kind of ethnic, ethnic nationalism that, that, is, this, that is very, very li uh, alive and, and, and prevalent, uh, prevalent in the region. So even with progressive parties, you know, one ear is always kind of open to, to, to that kind, kind of concern from, from the electorate. So I think it's, 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 a, it's a difficult uh, mix to, to move forward and uh, uh, sideline these uh, this, uh, informal networks that operate on clientelist uh, principle. Slave. Take on that is a kind of. Um, I think we, after 20 years, we had this. We had for 20 years, 30 years, this uh, ruralization of cities, where the uh, the, the whole um, political culture was completely, you know, insensitive to to any any change. Where the national historic work well, but if you may be doing it for um, 20 years and you repeat, you repeat, repeat. At least when I, you know, come to to to. Uh, um, uh, former countries, then I can see that you know people get fed up. They they don't receive anymore. And especially we are talking here about the larger cities, bigger cities, and we are talking about this kind of um, urban elites which which uh, want to integrate more uh, globally. And this doesn't simply work. So maybe it's not accident that this uh, what happened in Zagreb recently, what happened in Sarajevo, Banja Luka, that maybe there is some kind of socio 
cultural change um, and there are some segments of population which are not any more sensitive to that. So maybe it opens um, option for more kind of liberal democracy solution, but equally, uh, I'm not sure whether this will be the only option because uh, uh, what I could see in, in Serbia that you can also um, direct energies of, of uh, layers of, of, uh, of, of elites, of group of professional elites more towards the kind of uh, um, type of populism, which are energetic, which are even economically uh, uh, dynamic, but go on, an, on another direction. So I don't know in which direction it will go, but uh, we are now in some kind of um, uh, <laughs> point where it can go one direction or the other. I think it, even it may not be, it may be quite different in different parts of the, of, of the ex Yugoslavia. So, but Jovan will, will know more, I'm sure, in his uh, uh, account on, on Serbia, so. Should we wait and we'll, maybe we'll have a break before we come to Jovan's uh, paper, but I just wondered if we could quickly refer to the question by Simon Glynn, and this actually refers to something similar to something that Susan was saying earlier on about how um, people in the State Department were actually very ignorant, but there were plenty of academics who knew what was going on and they simply weren't listened to. So this question from Simon Glynn is why the British intelligence got things wrong consistently, uh, considering that there was a pool of expertise among academics in the UK. And maybe, Anne, uh, there is also another question from Jakob Savo, but I think but we that's, have... That's more yeah, historically... Yeah, among Should audience, we have a people that can think during the break uh, how to answer that question. Okay, yes. Yeah, yeah, let's let's do that because that, that's more about the causes, isn't it? But let, let's let's take this one about the um, the experts first. Yes, Susan. One of the things that I don't know the answer about British intelligence, because yes, I mean, that part of the foreign office had always been filled with people with great intelligence, great knowledge. So... <laughs> Um, I'm not sure how to answer that question. Um, I think it's maybe more that the role of the, the political leaders, diplomats, of, you know, like Carrington and so forth, um, weren't so attached to what, and this is again back to what Xavier is saying about the nature of diplomacy, um, wasn't, weren't so attached to, the, to knowledge and they weren't, um, they weren't writing the Dayton Accord, for example. Um, but I do think it's interesting to remember that the European um, community still, it was six months before they changed their name to the European Union. Um, when they, when Van den Broek, um, uh, the Dutch foreign minister, had the chair of the, um, the what I'm forgetting what the, call, the group of three is called, um, went in in June to start negotiating and it ended up negotiating Brioni. Um, he had an advisor who was incredibly knowledgeable about Yugoslavia. And they said, without changing the borders, that is to say, negotiating the border changes, there will be war. And they couldn't persuade any other members. David Owen reviews, um, reveals this in his book, um, that in the secret correspondence among the the um, members of the European Council that no one wanted to do what was, it was just, they were too lazy, why bother? So it was, whether there was British intelligence, I don't know, but there was Dutch intelligence that was excellent and it didn't have any out, um, positive outcome. Thank you, Susan. Uh, Jovan, did you want to say something there? Yeah. Yes, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, yes. about the the level of, of excellence, of expertise on, on ex-Yugoslavia. Uh, the situation was very diverse. I witnessed one thing in, in the State Department. I was there uh, in February of 1990. I was received in a room uh, and there was, it was practically the Department for Yugoslavia and Albania at that time, uh, which had shelves on the walls with two and a half books on Yugoslavia. <laughs> you know, I didn't have the feeling, you know, that somebody, you know, was reading at, at least. I, I might be wrong, but uh, there was uh, an analysis on the expertise on ex-Yugoslavia done by our 
a, a colleague from, from Denmark, from this Copenhagen school. Uh, and he actually uh, focusing mostly on smaller uh, nations rather than Britain or, or the US. What he concluded during the 90s was actually the expertise in many countries, many European countries uh, depended on people actually who had studied languages only before. And this is why they were in the departments within the ministries of foreign affairs and they dealt with, I don't know, Yugoslavia and Hungary and so on and so on. So there was, you know, there was a problem obviously, which was not the biggest problem, you know, when we discuss the, the role of international factors of uh, particular countries, but there, there was something missing <coughs> in this expertise, obviously, thank you. Um, so we went to part three and part three was about successor states. Luckily, we've already had some discussion of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Um, we were hoping that we'd be joined by contributors who wrote about Slovenia and um, about Macedonia, but they're not here, are they? So that's a shame. Um, so, but we do have Serbia and Montenegro, um, if you remember, it used to be one state. Um, and so it's wonderful that we've got Jovan, who's going to be talking about that. And then afterwards, um, Ivan, who wrote the conclusion to the book, is going to be saying something as well. So that's the plan for this part of the, of the seminar. So Jovan, would you like to start? Yes, thank you very much. My chapter covered the main political and economic trends in Serbia and Montenegro during the first half of the 90s. Uh, I might have written longer about uh, the Milosevic rise to power. I did mention that, I did analyze it to, to some extent, but somehow uh, this was the, the, the focus was on, on the first half of this uh, decade. And I, looking back at what I wrote and what has happened in the meantime, a lot obviously, uh, I formulated several points that I would like to, to share with you, um, seven of them actually, starting with, with the one actually that I didn't want to, to touch upon, but uh, this morning I, I read uh, an, a long interview with the, with the with this ex-Slovenian uh, president Kuchan, uh, this, the second interview in a row after the one that was mentioned by Susan, with Susan and Jean-Marie Chalic. Uh, and it was interesting and um, actually the, it was entitled, uh, according to one of Kuchan's main points, that the, uh, it, was it was inevitable for Yugoslavia to disintegrate. That somehow uh, motivated me to say the opposite. And there are, as, as all of us know, there are proponents of this and that um, thesis many, many of them, but I would like to, to start with that. So it was not at all uh, inevitable. And of course, as we all know, specific external and internal dynamics contributed to this. With the end of the Cold War, uh, the country lost its external legitimacy first, I would say, the less important part of, of the legitimacy, but important. Because the, uh, the non-alignment lost the purpose in uh, in a post-cold uh, context. Internally, and much more importantly, of course, I think there was a, a choice in front uh, with which the political and intellectual elites faced. And uh, <clears throat> they chose the separation and not uh, Yugoslav-wide democracy. And thus, I think they deprived the country uh, of the only way that could save it. Perhaps, and this runs, by the way, counter to many claims that Yugoslavia was possible only as long as it was non-democratic. I don't share this uh, at all. As we see now, that was mentioned many times in our conversation today, in uh, the UK, in Spain, etc., perhaps democracy would have in the long run led to the same or similar result in Yugoslavia. But 30 years ago, that's my, my point, it just didn't get a chance. A chance to somehow channel the conflicts within the institutions, within some um, regulations. 
The second thesis that I have is that Yugoslavia missed the opportunity that was offered uh, to all post ex communist countries in 1982. And actually, you know, th that was at uh, the time of the demise of communism in Europe. We didn't have to do anything with that. And that was for me, this was fascinating, actually. It, it was just as something uh, unrelated to us was happening somewhere very, very far from us. Didn't have to do anything with us because the whole country was completely absorbed then at the end of 89 and 90 already by conflicts and preparations for the dissolution. And the dissolution would become, I dare to say, much more popular among the population uh, within, uh, uh, I'm sorry, after the beginning of military conflicts. So despite official slogans, liberal democracy that could have been a motivation from the Anus Mirabilis 18.9 never became a priority and collectivist ideas and nationalism uh, prevailed. To my surprise, and I think I share the same view with, with some of you who said more or less the same, nationalism has remained exceptionally strong across almost the whole ex-Yugoslav space until this very day. Contrary to most expectations from the times uh, when, when the wars uh, ended. While not the only, of course, it is, like in the 90s, the single most effective instrument that can keep politicians in power in many ex yugoslav countries. And now to Serbia. When it comes to Serbia, despite some efforts by uh, the, the first post Milosevic's governments, Nationalism is still the main ideology, I'm afraid, but not ideology in, in a traditional sense. I would use um, a term that was used first by the first speaker of uh, Slovenian parliament after Yugoslavia, nationalism as a political technology. And in Serbia, this has been epitomized in the Great Serbia project that is alive and kicking. 10 years ago, if, if, if you had asked me, I may, may not have said this so loud and clear, but it is alive and kicking, Great Serbia project. The geographical contours of this idea have changed, and now the appetite has uh, shrinked, it, it, is, it has been diminished. So the targets now uh, are not complete territories of Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, or uh, Kosovo, but as the current example, e extremely interesting example with Montenegro shows, Serbia has never really come to terms with independent and sovereign Montenegro. The real question is whether the same scenario would, uh, would repeat itself in case of Croatia. Uh, there are no Serbs left there, so maybe not. My fifth uh, uh, this is, is, as in Milosevic's time, Serbia is still trying to present itself as a regional leader, but it is acting again as a regional bully instead, disregarding all changes in Europe and in the Balkans that have occurred in the meantime. I mean the EU-NATO web that surrounds uh, Serbia. And instead of prioritizing the EU accession, as many uh, could have uh, hoped for, with the whole package that goes with that, Serbia has turned into aut autocracy with aggressive behavior towards neighbors and complete denial of its role in the conflicts of the 1990s. Several days ago, when the Montenegrin Assembly uh, famously uh, passed this resolution on Srebrenica genocide, <clears throat> you could see in Vucic's uh, uh, media in Serbia that actually the, the denial of genocide in, in Srebrenica has never been, never until now, so big as it is now. So for me, with Vucic or somebody else at the helm, um, Serbia is not really interested in joining the EU. Within this accession process, the most important part uh, with, with the rule of law and democracy, of course, negotiations with Kosovo 
after so many years, we can see that these are these negotiations perhaps are merely a smokescreen behind the central idea to keep this frozen conflict alive, in contrast to what Vucic has been saying for years and what he said in a five hour long speech at the Serbian assembly two days ago. Uh, as long as uh, the geopolitical wins, this is the hope of, of the Serbian nationalists, until the geopolitical wins somehow change directions in Serbia's favor. Vucic, in my view, like most of his feeble opposition, has also become hostage of his own strategically disoriented foreign and security policy that he didn't invent, by the way. It was invented by, by Boris Tadic. And quite a lot of the ideology of the Serbian Progressive Party actually has been taken from, from Tadic's Democratic Party. So with promises to the West and to the East and profits from both sides, and essentially being interesting, interested only in keeping the status quo and like Milosevic, without any idea concerning the exit strategy. So after the, set, after the step number one, what would be the steps number two, three, et cetera? No idea. He said literally two days ago at the assembly, I repeat, in a five, like Castro, in a five hour long speech, he was actually <clears throat> criticizing the MPs for leaving the, you know, the, the premises, going to the toilet, you know, because he didn't go for five hours. Uh, and that speaks volumes about his personality. Uh, so the, he said uh, there should be a compromise uh, about Kosovo, but I don't know what compromise should consist of. We, we know that actually for years. He says he wants compromise, but he never said openly what would be the solution for, for Kosovo. And the last two I, uh, thesis, I'm sorry, the stubborn continuity of one and the same idea with, and this is important, with serious repercussions in, for reconciliation and, and uh, regional cooperation, that speaks volumes about the lack of capacity of Serbia's both political and intellectual elites to understand the world around them and how the world functions and what should be done to adapt to it in order to provide for a decent future. The problem, however, and this is, I think, one of the most important realizations I've come to, are not only those in or near the power. Uh, my realization is not so, uh, how to say, clever, but I'm, I don't learn fast. It seems to me that citizen, the society is the problem also, maybe in an equal uh, manner. Most citizens of Serbia share the same ideas maybe because there is no competition of ideas, free competition, together with firm support for unchecked power of almighty leaders since 1987 on, while the remaining and equally powerless part is captured by apathy, having lost all hopes that things could, get, could get ever, ever get better, young people with their own and with their parents 30 plus years of experience, they're leaving the country with one way tickets. And the last uh, part of my story, the regime change part of the whole story with which I began my lessons learned should be mentioned at the end once again. Last August, Montenegro did get a new government after an astonishing and unmatched period of 31 years of Milo Djukanovic's undivided rule. But Djukanovic is still a president within a thorny cohabitation, and the government doesn't seem to be capable to last long. In Serbia, uh, 13 years after Milosevic's era, 87 to 2000, we, ha we had for the, uh, sorry, uh, uh, and 12 years after more or less reformist governments, between the years 2000 and 2012, we have had for the last nine years the same parties and some of the same personalities in power who used to rule the country in the bloody decade of the 90s. We could thus say that in a way, 
and differently from other ex-EU states, except for Bosnia, perhaps, Serbia has made a full circle during the last three decades, returning to the initial position from where the Yugoslav uh, drama started and with no new ideas and, and policies. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, oh, thank you very much. Um, Ivan, would you like to come in now? Uh, yeah, we're at, at two and a half hours <laughs> of uh, dissecting and uh, doing a, a, a case study of, of what we've all uh, gone through. Um, I, uh, well, it's a pity that we don't have Frane Adam and, uh, and Ferid, uh, and so I'll, I'll say, I'll give a plug basically to, to a few things that all of us know, you know, the, the kind of million dollar question one, one dies to ask our Slovenian friends, what is the matter with you? Why is Janez Jansha the prime minister of your wonderful country? Okay, so populism, you know, writ large. Uh, Macedonia, incredible. I mean, they've, they've had a, a change. They had their, their Orbans and Jansha through Grueski, who's, by the way, uh, having a quiet time in Budapest somewhere. Uh, Zaev and, and the party made a change and they, they made, I think this really needs to be underlined uh, strongly. They, they made a historical compromise. They addressed their big issue with Greece and, you know, in my book, Greece is not off the hook for the responsibility they had to hold back uh, Macedonia uh, back in 2008-9 at NATO summit when they blocked their entry, when Albania was given a green light. Uh, so um, I think an aspect of international intervention is to look at what happened later and who has blocked whom uh, in very un-European, undemocratic, unkind of worldly ways. Uh, and I add France here that blocked Macedonia in October 2019 uh, as a, a French student, a Francophile and Francophone, I was outraged by what Macron did. Um, as North Macedonia had achieved uh, a really difficult thing, a change of name. I mean, this, this is, and, and you know, uh, kudos to, to Prime Minister Tsipras and Zaev for actually acting as Europeans with a, a strategy, uh, as Jovan says, you know, <laughs> there's lots of lack of strategy, but these two persons, you know, we can go into the reasons for what, uh, why they went into it, but uh, they've ticked a huge box in, in our region uh, to solve one of the uh, thorny issues that, that we've had. Um, so uh, I think we, we need to, to focus on those examples. I concur with Jovan on Montenegro, uh, a huge change. Uh, I think uh, Milo Djukanovic shot himself in the foot humongously by trying to put the, forward this law on, on religion. Many of our and my Montenegrin friends will tell you quietly that that is the case. He could have continued to rule had he not touched that beehive. A very complicated history uh, and identity issue. Um, and now we have a government that's trying to steer a very fine line between uh, Serbia and Vucic uh, on the one hand and uh, Milo Djukanovic on the other small country, lack of capacity, everyone knows everyone and everyone else's grandmother and grandfather. And uh, so, you know, I, my hope is that they somehow uh, manage to muddle through. It's, it's fragile. Uh, the coalition, um, you know, is, is in danger of collapsing. They're being pushed around and uh, in various ways, uh, Johan said that. And, uh, and Serbia uh, is, uh, is where, where Jovan said it is. I believe uh, that the, this whole world uh, that, uh, of, of a Serbian world that Jovan described is more for purely uh, technological political reasons of the catch-all party that, that Vucic has. He's trying to keep all the strands possible from, from the extreme right to kind of a liberal part of the, if there is such a thing, of the Progressive Party. And uh, he's playing on, on all 
all registers. Um, I think the question that the opposition is not asking uh, or not clearly asking is what is it that keeps his ratings around 50% plus minus on, on a given day? What is it that he's doing to either create the apathy that Johan talked about or the satisfaction or the minimal satisfaction that, that people have? Is it the handouts? And there he follows uh, Kaczynski and Orban, uh, various social social handouts. Is it the highways that he is building that our friends like Tadic should have built? Uh, uh, is it uh, the the successful vaccine policy, which is probably one of the most positive things that have been done um, under him? Uh, and uh, I would say that what's interesting with Vucic, if you compare him to an Orban, he cares very much what the West thinks. And so he works with the Soros family. Uh, he uh, appears on television together. He opens a, a cultural Roma rights center that only exists in Berlin. Belgrade is the second city where uh, that thing has appeared, um, has put a, a Roma state uh, a secretary in, uh, has, you know, we can, we can describe it any way we want, but he has uh, named a, a, a prime minister who's a, a gay lesbian, uh, uh, poking the eye of the Orthodox Church. And so that, that issue is kind of quietened down completely uh, since he has, you know, we can say what we want, and I'm sure there's a lot to say about the prime minister herself. But it's interesting how he's, uh, how he's uh, swirling uh, the, the political situation. And uh, not only does he not sleep much, but he, he speaks very much, as Johan just said, you know, morning, lunchtime, and, and afternoon. And as we all know, anecdotally looks at the opinion polls, and I think is one of the biggest experts on political marketing that there are uh, among, among uh, contemporary, contemporary leaders. And I completely concur with Johan. There is no strategy. I mean, I've had as we all have had talks with a variety of people. And, you know, you ask, well, Gingich is the only one who had a clear strategy on, on Kosovo. Uh, unfortunately, he was assassinated. I think after him, nobody had a, you know, this is where we need to go. Gingich would come into the office and say, we need to deal with the Hague Tribunal and Kosovo as quickly as possible, because this is the ball and chain around our leg. If we don't do it, we're stuck. I think all Afterwards, there hasn't been the political strategic courage to set a line for Serbia. This is what we want. This is what we think a compromise is. Either they talk about it quietly and never come out or dare to come out with it. And I think that's, that's what's holding back. Of course, the fact that in Kosovo, we've had a situation where there was political instability. So you didn't have a second partner to tango with which is now possible with, with Kurti, and he was in Paris, as you saw with Macron. We don't know what's, what the talks are behind the scenes. Uh, Matt Palmer, Deputy Assistant Secretary, and uh, Miroslav Lajcak traveled together to the region. We know that the Americans are the only ones who have any leverage in Kosovo. The European Euro Union has zero. Um, but at the same time, the, the position uh, regardless of what we call the third actors, Russia, China, Turkey, Emirates, etc., the, the whole region, including Serbia, is uh, tightly intertwined with the European Union through trade and investments. I mean, the number is whatever it is, around 65, 70%. We depend on Western money, as Tito did <laughs> back in the day. Uh, through the IMF and, and others. Uh, the principal investments, the serious investments are from Western companies and Vucic has made a case of attracting a lot of German companies there. Of course, there are the Chinese investments, but my two cents on that is all our countries need infrastructure development. Why is there no geoeconomics from the West coupled with geopolitics? to help us build the highways and the bridges that we need. Uh, I think that is a priority. And frankly, I'm very happy that we have the highways uh, that we have now. It's easier to get to various places. And uh, I think that there has been something of a, of a strategy in, in that dimension. 
Uh, politically, the opposition is is nowhere to be seen. Their problem is that they ha that they are have beens. They've been in power. People know what they did, and in fact, they created the system that quote unquote Vucic upgraded to you know extreme heights of control of media, of you know clientelism, of uh, you know uh, helping their their cronies uh, and the rest. Um, the the um, well, you know, I'm supposed to talk about the conclusion here. Um, I, I use this title, "The Extremes of Suffering," uh, which is a quote from Isaiah Berlin uh, when asked, you know, what what is what is a good government? What is what is good governance? And uh, Isaiah Berlin said, "It's to avoid the extremes of suffering." Unfortunately, Milosevic led us into the extremes of suffering. And you know, uh, not the only one, but uh, clearly one of the major players, along with Tujman and, and others. Um, I think we we've come out of that. Again, I repeat, I don't think we'll see a war. We're too close to the war that we had. I think there's something in in a historical dynamic that doesn't allow you, you know, uh, to to have two successive wars so quickly, and that's why. I have maintained that that we won't have a war. Yeah, we'll have all the all the very complicated situation that we have. Uh, I think it's extremely important uh, that uh, we have um, a reconciliation that's nowhere near. Uh, we the Serbian-Croatian relationship or Croatian-Serb is fundamental to the region historically. Uh, as you all know, that is that relationship made Yugoslavia. Uh, it undid it as well. And if there isn't a stable and reconciled relationship between the two major players, then the other th uh, other pieces of the puzzle don't fall into place. Uh, it is, I think, comfortable uh, to have the status quo on Kosovo, even though which it said that's not what he wants. I think there's an urgency in my book. There's an urgency to solve it if if we are to move forward. And the so-called uh, Angela Merkel talked about the snail space of EU integration of the whole region uh, two years ago, I believe already. It continues to be a snail pace. Uh, there is no advance, and Serbia is is you know the bad pupil in the book. Uh, we you all know that that is the case, and yet there is at the at the moment no other alternative. I mean. Uh, you know, Russian colleagues who deal with the same things as we do know very well where this region belongs. They will make noises and try and tell Montenegro that it's the worst thing if they join NATO. They will try and impede North Macedonia joining NATO. They can't stop those things. They will be the spoiler. They will put sticks in the wheels. They will give money to journalists, to hoodlums, to uh, the Sputniks to, uh, you know, what's interesting, anecdotally, some of you may know that in Belgrade, we have Sputnik and Voice of America, and their two half hour radio shows are back to back uh, at 2 p.m. on Studio B. And I sometimes masochistically expose myself to the half hour Sputnik and then cleanse myself with VOA uh, after that. And, and that's this kind of schizophrenia in which we are in. Uh, Jovan is absolutely right to say this policy had begun under, under Boris Tadic, and you know many of us spoke against this. You can't sit on four stools. This is the, um, the, the missing limb of Yugoslavia, right, uh, non-aligned. And um, among the many other things to say, I will say that we suffered, uh, I think it was to Jovan's point or maybe someone else before, you know, Yugoslavia was oblivious to what was happening with the fall of the Berlin Wall. I think it had to do with this uh, megalomaniac sense that Yugoslavia was something special, the Yugoslav exceptionalism. We were loved by everyone. You know, Tito's funeral was attended by 140 world leaders. You know, why should we care about uh, the Iraq war or the fall of the Berlin Wall? You know, we we are good for ourselves and that's how we ended uh, where we where we did, absorbed totally by ourselves, by our naval gazing, and again, by the power and tension strategy of the communist elites of our countries, from Kuchan in Slovenia to, you know, Kiro Gligorov, actually, they, they managed to get out of it without too much cost, but then they had their own little, little conflict in, in 2001. Um, 
I think that uh, given the state of the European Union and the challenges that the European Union is confronted with, there has been a slight wake up call uh, given the Russian, Chinese, et cetera, interference. There's a little more activity and a little more kind of firm talk. I don't think it will change very much un unless there's somewhat more uh, investments, but the European Union is not helping any of this by not dealing with rule of law, uh, threat threats to the rule of law in the Polands and the Hungaries of the world. So people like Wojciech see, you know, you can be a full EU member, you can be a full NATO member, and yet be doing the things that you're doing. Why not replicate what, what you're doing? So I think we're seeing a period of, uh, of political stagnation. I think economically things, things will, will advance. Uh, we have a generation of high-tech uh, nerdy kids. Uh, um, a, I was gonna say a Yugoslav, a Serbian um, uh, IT company, uh, that uh, deals that does computer games just sold itself to an American company for two hundred and fifty million dollars. So, again, lots of things going on. We're not in the nineties. Yes, the 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 Likovi, the 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 personae are there. You know the Dacicis and Vucicis, but uh, things things have changed. Not always for the better. Definitely nationalism still there, but fueled by the politicians. And uh, sort of my, my final obvious word is politics is still very much top down in all of our countries. The message coming from the top defines kind of the, 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 the ambience that we live in. Uh, Milo Djurkanovic, when in 1997, he decided to split with Milosevic, changed Montenegro. I mean, the suddenly, uh, everybody thought differently in Montenegro. And so until our leaders start doing a more reconciliatory, giving a more reconciling message towards uh, their neighbors, and uh, as I like to say, until we start becoming champions of each other and you know, putting out the hand, we will be kind of in this kind of situation. Thank you. So you're back where you started today, actually talking about lack of democracy as being fundamental. Uh, Xavier wanted to come in, I think. I had a question, but uh, Ivan answered it. Oh, right. Okay, great. D does anybody else on the panel want to make any remarks, any final remarks? Um, uh, I, I would yes, like to... Me. I think it's quite important, this uh, highlights from what Ivan said, um, in case of... Uh, because uh, Johan said we are... Serbia is a full circle, but then it is full circle, but it's not the same dynamics of the place and it's not the same place. So I think that's essential to see what is that in kind of new Serbian version of urbanism, Erdoganism, its own contradiction that creates a new dynamics. I mean, um, my only final comment is uh, my contacts with, with the Serbian kind of, let's call them semi-academic, academic elite is actually, I was confused because uh, actually you see that they want to be in between. They, are, uh, they don't want to be in the EU e effectively. You know, kind of. But then it reminded me, said, I, I said, but do we want to be a new non-aligned? But then the way they play that game is extremely primitive. I mean, it's horribly primitive, so to say. So the, the level of sophistication, which is uh, uh, you know, required for this intelligent playing in between powers is, is still not there, but uh, Maybe, maybe that is a kind of a sophisticated version which will happen in the future. God knows, you know, kind of. But it's definitely not the the full circle back where it was. So, and well, now we are trying to look at the, you know, glass and and you know, seeing what is the future. I mean, we've seen, we look at the past thirty years. So I think we better stop here and, and not guess too much about the future. So, Susan. Susan, um, even I'm wondering if you could share a little bit about the Slovene Croatian conflicts, apropos of your discussion of the, the need for champions of leaders that, you know, um, going back after all, that's where it all started, in my view, as you know, um, it doesn't, it seems worse than ever. I, I was interested, we haven't talked much about Croatia, 
um, I was in a, a panel, book panel, um, at the ASN a couple of weeks ago for Mila Dragojevic's book, Amoral Communities, where she looked at its, its beautiful research about how um, people in the middle were excluded. And um, well, I can go, you could read the book, it's, but it's, it's really about the, the process of how nationalism took over and violence took over in Croatia. I'm bringing it up because it turns out she had a, a reception, that she's had a translation in Croatia. She had a reception there with lots of, they refused to use that title. They gave it a title I don't even remember, it was so innocuous. Um, it's clear the Croats, even in the intellectual class, weren't willing to accept what she was saying based on her research among Croatians of, of how, how this thing evolved and, and then even to the point that she has no data, she's talking about the, the violence in, in terms of civilian deaths and how it could have, how could communities that live together then turn on each other in civilian ways, not the military component. And it turns out she's not even allowed to get um, deaths, the numbers of deaths totals in Croatia, the official who were in charge refused to give it to her. And that's very much in contrast to this wonderful civil society group in Bosnia that we all know did a very, very careful um, analysis of the totally, you know, precise information about who died and where. So the contrast between the two countries in that regard, Bosnians themselves, at least some of them coming to terms with the past in that way, and the and Croatians not, I, I think was really striking. Well, uh, lots to say. I'm actually speaking to you from Croatia, from the island of Fres, um, uh, full of Slovenian tourists, by the way, just jam-packed. Slovenian is more spoken than Croatian here in this small, uh, small place. Um, well, one thing, the Slovenes and Croatians are not giving us a good example by not having resolved their border dispute. Uh, they're both EU and NATO members. You can live quietly uh, with a more or less open border, even if you haven't solved your, your border. But as I said, it's not a, not a good example to, to the rest of us. Uh, I'm not an expert on either, but I spoke to two distinguished uh, historians uh, here, uh, Tvrtko Jakovina and Hrvoje Klasic, uh, who gave me a kind of uh, <laughs> mouthful on, on the kind of things that, that you're talking about. Um, I was stunned to hear that a uh, high level position in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Croatia is held by the sister of the person who assassinated Yugoslav Ambassador Rolovic in, in Sweden. Uh, and the person who tried to assassinate uh, Kido Gligorov uh, in uh, Buenos Aires is also an employee of the, of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So that gives you a bit of a flavor, not to say, you know, the, I mean, there, there are great people and, and things are going on. So uh, the nationalism, uh, what Jovan was saying, I mean, is, is well and alive. Uh, Slovenes are, of course, closer to the Alps, so it's a bit cooler uh, up there, and uh, they, they, they have things going for them. But I think it's revealing to see that, that Jancha is prime minister. And of course, there, there are civic, uh, civil movements. Uh, there are good investigative journalists in all of our countries who are revealing a lot of this stuff. But the, and obviously there are, you know, independent media. Uh, yes, on, on cable, TV, yes, in small print, but if you want to be informed, you can. The problem is the, the hold on public uh, media or state-held state media where most people, at least in Serbia, get their, their information from. And I think it's, it's the, or, and the tabloids, obviously, that in Serbia are fighting with everyone and anyone in the world on every morning, whether it's Albanians or Croats or NATO or, you know, whipping up this atmosphere. Um, I, uh, I, I think that's, that's hugely detrimental and that keeps everyone, or at least the, those people who support uh, the, the ruling party, 
uh, away uh, from you know thinking about the situation in in their own in their own pockets. So uh, even those countries that have joined uh, the EU and, and NATO, I think uh, you know they still have a long to, way to go. I mean, not final word, but I think um, I think that this region is is part of the West. I mean, in in geopolitical terms. You know, we're far from a democratic political culture. That's something that, as you all remember, Darendorf said would take 60 years uh, to create the good news. I like to say is 20 years have already gone by. <laughs> so uh, we have another 40 years to go. Um, and uh, it, is, uh, it is, it behooves the European Union, you know, if it thinks to have a role in the world, uh, the geopolitical commission and the rest, to have a much more engaged uh, view to push back on on the well, not only on the third party actors, the Russians and Chinas, but to do more in the in the region. I mean, you know, just look at the map and and you'll see where this is. And I think Serbia will, uh, at a certain point, join NATO, probably before it joins the EU. You know, not not for tomorrow, maybe in in ten years, but uh, again. Uh, can you go it alone when you're completely surrounded by everyone else? Yeah, we can't pretend to be, uh, I think Slavo was alluding to this group of people who think we can be a Switzerland or a, or a, or a Finland, you know, and stay out of this. Uh, well, we don't produce cuckoo clocks and chocolate. That's the difference. Okay, I think Jovan, you had wanted to speak and then maybe Slavo for the very final point. Yes, very briefly. Uh... The unhappy situations in Slovenia and Croatia have been mentioned. And I wanted to say, actually, that's something we, we often miss. How people in countries that are still not members of the EU or NATO sometimes uh, very carefully look at the countries they are familiar with, they have been familiar with, and they learn, actually. So symbolically, it's very important for Serbs who became uh, uh, Eurosceptics uh, in, the, in the last several years uh, to see what is going on in, in Croatia. For example, when Croatia entered the EU, and I think two or three years after that, there was not a rise in Croatian GDP at all for 13 years, I think. Please correct me if I'm wrong. So, what is the lesson? Why go into all these troubles, you know? to get a non-functional economy. The things change, of course. There were two other lessons for ex-Yugoslavs when it comes to entering, uh, to being together with other states in international organizations. The first lesson, also even, even worse than the Croatian one, was the Greek lesson. So Greece was understood at one point, in Serbia, in Macedonia at least, as a gateway to Europe. Greece was not supposed to be only the first Balkan country in the European Union, but also with the EU membership card, the first European country in the Balkans. It failed completely. So this was for us an enormously important lesson. And the third lesson is actually because I see London and <laughs> behind and uh, is Brexit, you know. Uh, all our ex uh, post Yugoslav states actually care very much about territorial integrity and sovereignty. You know, once Brexit happened, I was there by the way in London <laughs> five years ago. Uh, actually, it showed to us that even you know old and uh, old states and old democracies, you know, can have a similar destiny like Yugoslavia. So this is this was became in our eyes <clears throat> one more reason why not to believe that the EU is, you know, is, is a wonderland, you know. Uh, so these, I, I, I repeat, sim symbolism of these examples actually is very, very important. Thank you. Can I just add one sentence? I, I've sort of said this every time that I get a chance to speak. Were we to have a referendum this coming Sunday, on whether we want to join the European Union, you'd have a majority, a clear majority of people who want to join for 
purely uh, normal, commonsensical reasons. Not only is it better to be a part of the club, you will enter Schengen, you will have the Euro, and there's some kind of ex, uh, you know, gram of certainty more and gram of prosperity more if you're inside. And Nikola Dimitrov, uh, the Macedonian, North Macedonian foreign minister, uh, said it very simply when he was in, in the Netherlands about a year or two ago, you know, the, the journalists asked him, why, why the hell do you want to join? Look at the state of the European Union, Brexit, you know, all, all of these things. He simply said, you don't know what it is to be like outside of the European Union. Thank you very much. Uh, Anne, we have five minutes. Uh, we are closing. We should wrap it up, shouldn't we? Why, why don't you do that? Yes, because there is no time for further questions. And I think uh, we were hoping that we will fill up two hours, but we, at the end, uh, did completely three hours. And I could see that now would be actually the most uh, entertaining type of discussion that we could have. It's really a pity that we are not in live and that we could continue and carry on in some, you know, restaurant with the CEO and continue, you know, uh, with, 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 with this. But uh, thanks to everybody, this was really, I knew that this would be extremely interesting and good event. And I really think we, we had a very good uh, gathering and we did a kind of almost like really section. So if any of the students kind of, of area studies wants to study that, then I think uh, this should be given as addition to, to book as this recording. So I, I think uh, we've done a really interesting uh, job because we look at uh, the past for two hours and then we manage even to address the, the present issue. I would like to thank very much to all the colleagues, contributors, to all of you uh, that were patient with us and uh, coming with questions. I would like to thank very much to Anne for excellent moderation and to Patricia for being person behind. And we will let you know what, when we'll have this recording uploaded and, and when you can find it. Uh, so I thank you all very, very much. And it was a, despite the constraints of virtual reality, it was as human as it could be. So thank you. Anne, if you want to say anything else. I just wanted to say thank you as well to all the panelists. It was really wonderful and the audience as well for their excellent questions and to Slavo for having the idea in the first place and making it happen. Pleasure. Thank you. All. Thank you, Slavo. Thank, thank you, all. Anne. Bye. See you somewhere, somewhere later on. Bye-bye. <laughs>